Bonsoir, bienvenue à la 16e édition du Festival Artistique et Féministe Les Créatives. Ce soir, place à une conversation entre Loretta Ross, ContraPoints et Lorraine Bastide sur la perfection militante. La conversation sera interprétée en français sur le site des Créatives et sur euh, Facebook. Si vous voulez suivre la conversation en anglais, rendez-vous sur YouTube. Voilà, bonne soirée. Bonne soirée. Hello, les Creative Festival attendees. Good evening. Uh, good evening or morning to you, according to where on the planet you're watching us. My name is Lorraine Bastide. I'm a journalist, author, and feminist activist from France. Uh, and it is my great honor to be hosting this conversation tonight with two women I truly admire. Loretta Ross, you're a women's rights activist fighting for reproductive justice for over 50 years. It's such an honor to talk to you because you are a living legend. Your accomplishments are impossible to enumerate, but you were one of the voices of women of color at 1977 Women Conference. You created the National Center for Human Rights Education and the sister song Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective in the 90s. And You became one of the world's most renowned experts for on abortion for black women, as well as an advocate for rape survivors. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me on your show. And Natalie Wynn, you're a philosopher and a YouTuber. Your channel, ContraPoints, which I have been following for a while, like one million other people, is an extremely useful place to get information about politics in the US. You use your unique sense of rhetoric and amazing makeup skills to fight against, uh, well, fascism. Uh, your work is remarkably beautiful and relevant. I might have commented a few of your social media posts by a single I love you because I do I'm really a fan welcome Natalie hi thank you so much for having me and hello everyone <laughs> uh, and I also want to thank Anne Wolfli for interpreting this conversation into French so there will be tons of conversations to have about both your personal path and activist achievements but you're here with us tonight because you have also become experts on this quote-unquote cancel culture or call-out culture you both brought extremely measured and clever insights on this incredibly tricky subject uh, professor loretta ross you give a class at smith college about it this class has just been featured in the new york times in an article by jessica bennett Natalie, you created this incredible video about cancel culture that became one of the most viewed and famous video of your already very successful channel. Okay, so now let's get started. I'm gonna be stepping right into it with my first question. Some people, especially left-wing activists, say there is no such thing as cancel culture, that this word was invented by conservative to diminish the attempts of, pro of progressive people to hold them accountable for their oppressive behavior. Are these people wrong? I think they're both wrong and they're right. It's a very complicated question. I believe that the original council culture or call out culture was started by the Puritans when they had the witch hunts or the call outs when duels were taking place and people were being shot. I mean, that's the original definition of calling out. And so certainly it's a long standing strain in human behavior to be judgmental about people and to give public shaming to that judgment. So that's not new. What is new in my opinion is social media and how quickly and fast it can travel. And one of the things that I pay attention to is how the right is suddenly criticizing their own behaviors because they're the architects of call out culture when, pe when people on the left are using it to call them out and to punch them up as a punch up on them because it's really about the democratizing of the internet and the information and being able to use it to expose behaviors that they successfully kept hidden before. And so they're right and wrong. It's not new. It is a legitimate tool for us to use to address abuses of power. At the same time, we overuse it when we're just talking about people never being forgiven for a mistake they made a long time ago. 
Yeah, I agree with all that. I think you have to be um, specific about what you're talking about when you talk about cancel culture, because one of the problems with that term is it's so general. Is it about public shaming in general? Because if, it, if that's what we mean when we say cancel culture, then this has nothing to do with the left at all. This is just, I mean, a long standing like historical thing. Like, um, you know, many countries, many cultures have used public shaming as punishment. Uh, you know, on the internet, this has been like widely discussed in the forms of, uh, you know, women being shamed for posting nudes or like, uh, I don't know. Um, there's a, there's a whole book about this by John Ronson called So You've Been Publicly Shamed, which is about, you know, what was someone. Uh, there, there's like a right-wing example where some woman posted like a disrespectful uh, photo in Arlington Cemetery, the U.S. military cemetery, and like people basically tried to end her career in life, you know. So I think that uh, when I when I made my video about canceling, what I was more talking about is, um, you know, canceling as a kind of shunning or as a kind of um, uh, sort of exile from a certain community, and especially communities of activists. So I think of it as a kind of like within leftist thing where, uh, you know, it's it's what was described by Joe Freeman in this, um, I think, 1976 Ms. Magazine essay called Trashing, which is about basically um, her experiences being um, sort of exiled from within the women's movement and being sort of lied about and have rumors spread and having. So I think that uh, you know, you have to, when, we talk, when I talk about cancel culture, um, I'm talking specifically about this kind of shaming and um, exclusion that this doesn't really work. You know, I guess a lot of people point to like JK Rowling as an example. Her career is not really affected by this in any way. Although I don't know, I can't speak to the personal effect it may have had on her, but um. I think that, you know, there are cases where, where someone's career has been more or less ended. I haven't heard from the American comedian Louis C.K. in a while. So sometimes people, sometimes it works, but uh, a lot of the time, yeah, it's, it's, it is, there's another real phenomenon where people who are just complaining about being criticized or people complaining about like the fact that people are mad at them for the things they said, they say, oh, I'm being canceled. Well, uh, you know, I'm sorry that that's just how social media works. If you say something unpopular, or controversial, there's going to be a lot of, you know, kickback. Hmm. I think the people with privilege and power who are complaining about the cancel culture simply want what they've had in the past. And that's the ability to use their over large podiums and voices to have free speech without consequences. And unfortunately, there's a critic at every keyboard now, who can reach millions of people in a very short while with only 140 characters. And that scares them to death because they're not used to getting a pushback and being and be made to feel responsible for their words. And so those are not the ones that I really worry about because you're right, even if they're quote canceled, actually infamy still monetizes them. They still can make money. I worry more about how we use it horizontally against people of equal power or, or, or when we punch down, when we go after people with less power and privilege, which I think is an immoral use of our ability to, to be judgmental. But I'm not that worried about the pampered privileges, pampered privileged people who have their prejudices. I'm just not worried about them because I actually have a different strategy for them than trying to create a bridge or a calling in process for them. For them, I think calling out is totally appropriate. So when you say you worry about this horizontal canceling, what, what do you worry about? What worries you most? It worries me when you have a good friendship for 20 years and then you find out that they did something unbelievably stupid when they were young, like using the N word or dressing in an Indian costume for Halloween and that kind of thing. First of all, it worries me because you don't appreciate that people grow and change. 
And so you use that snapshot of them from a previous time in their life as if that describes their whole character and being and has a statement on where they are now. And that's simply not true. That's a very poor threat assessment. It's, a, it's too simplistic an analysis and we shouldn't reduce people to cardboard caricatures based on our interpretation of that snapshot of their life. They're, they're, it's an unfolding life, it's not just a snapshot. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I critique that practice. Or when people, even in today's conversation, are trying to give voice to what we call the unfolding thought, an incomplete thought that you don't have the exact right words for yet, but you're being honest and you're trying to say, I thought we could use the word retarded. I didn't know that that was a bad word now because for all the years I've heard about it, we said retarded. Well, you could either jump down their throats and say, oh, you should never say that word. Or you can just offer them love and compassion and say, you know, well, we used to use that word. Now, now people who are disabled that way, they like us to use this word. And I remember when I used to use the word, you have choices, not to let people escape harm, but you can make an intentional choice not to blow up their lives because of your perception of their harm. Mm -hmm. you, you just used the word simplification and it reminds me of something you say in your video, Natalie, about essentializing the people and turning very complex situation in uh, one sentence that doesn't sum it up, but just like mess it up. Uh, and I was, I kind of read it as a subculture of this post-truth reality we're living in. Like, if you see what I mean, like there is no longer such thing as truth. Anything that's written on the internet becomes some sort of truth. Well, I definitely think the internet makes us worse too, because with social media, um, you sort of never can escape the past. Everything that you post becomes part of this eternal present and if you, someone can view your old tweets just as readily as your new tweets, you can take a screenshot of something you posted five years ago and post it again. So I find that anyone who's like a semi-public figure online, there's people who kind of like, they sort of collate your list of crimes, like all the bad things that you ever posted. And then they use this to create this kind of um, vilifying um, collage of your worst moments and then they that's kind of used as evidence so that you are a bad person so that's like the essentializing thing right it's not just oh this person posted a dumb tweet on you know July 7th 2016 it's like this person is a racist a transphobe a misogynist right and it's like that is like a sort of total judgment of a person and not a kind of more measured like response to this one moment, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that most frustrates me is that there's no allowance for difference of opinion. Any pluralistic society is supposed to have honest debate. But when you, when you push the practice as a group think that we all must think exactly alike or I'm going to punish you, you're not creating a, a, a civil society, you're creating a cult. Yeah, there, there, that's a frustration I have is that there's no space made to be in disagreement, in conflict, without being enemies. And that's right like the dualism of this either you're good or you're evil and everyone's looking for signs to see whether you are a good okay person or you're a bad person based on your posts for example your tweets right and uh yeah if if it's it's like there's no subtlety like no middle ground between like oh this is like not a great opinion or like this is not very informed or like this could have been worded better because it kind of sounds like you're saying something that this is bad instead it's just it's just taken as like evidence of your allegiance with the forces of evil right like it's it's uh it's true it is kind of have this i guess sort of chilling effect on discussion where you feel like you cannot 
um, you know, even have like a partial disagreement without sort of becoming, you know, I mean, I find this with colleagues, like we cannot disagree in public or people will decide that we're enemies. Like, why can't you be in conflict without being enemies? Like friends are in conflict all the time. I don't know. It's, it's yeah. frustrating. Do you think it's relevant to stress the fact that uh, it's not a coincidence that this practical of cancel culture appeared during the Trump area, uh, during which uh, opinions and people got extremely polarized? Does it make sense to you? Um, well, I, I think, think that. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go on. You can go on. <laughs> well, I think it's part of it. Like, I think that. Um, I think there's almost a kind of like trauma of seeing because because the the sort of political duality in, in the United States has gotten or has been revealed as maybe so extreme, like there's a tendency to we've sort of like lost the ability to have to view these kind to view disagreement as like a thing that can sort of be worked out or can be treated as like that we don't have any procedure in place for like peacemaking or for conflict resolution right the only sort of practice we have is responding like oh you're one of the bad guys like you know we get you like everyone is a victim or an abuser in a sense right there's no sense that you can be um and i think that comes from you know yeah having a president who is an abuser and having you know an extremely far right like you know party is that it's i don't know we feel like we're at war i guess well this question has particular import for me because i teach about fascism in my class and what we're dealing with is a particularly americanized form of fascism that doesn't precisely look like what happened in germany and italy or even what's happening in Hungary or Turkey or other countries. But guys, our fascism doesn't have a swastika. It has a cross and an American flag and the Bible. So people are reluctant to even use the F word to describe it. Trump did not create this neo-fascist movement in our society. He was elected because there is a neo-fascist movement in our society. He's not smart enough to have created it. He's not even smart enough to do it well. <laughs> I mean, he's not that person. But at the same time, these things are in America's DNA. Our, I actually describe it as the unfinished civil war. We had a civil war 150 years ago, trying to decide the question of whether or not we were going to be a free and inclusive democracy, or are we going to be a republic in which only a small set of people had privilege, power, and money. And we've never actually decided that question. So we're citizens of a country that has yet to land on what it wants to be. <laughs> we're not there mm -hmm. yet. And so Trump is the outcome of a backlash against a black president, Barack Obama, who was leading us towards that inclusive, democratic, pluralistic society. And then half of our country decided that they did not like that future. They actually want to go backwards into the 19th century. That's what make America great again means make America the 19th century again in, in what we read. And they're frightened by not only the changes that they see, but that they anticipate because in 30 years, our country will not be a majority white country simply because of demographic. And so they're so harsh on immigration. They're trying to manipulate white women's fertility with the restrictions on board birth control and abortion. They're trying to just write trans and gay people out of, the, out of human society. I mean, they're acting like panicked people because they are demographically doomed. And the sad part is that ma the majority of the people who should be on our side, who we should call liberals, are afraid to use the F word. And if you misdiagnose fascism, then you're gonna be ill prepared to adequately fight it. 
Wow. Yeah, it's it's such a thank you so much for this analysis. Uh, it, it made me think when I was listening to you that you don't destroy the master's house with the master's tool to quote Audrey Lord. And I think it's what you mean when you talk about calling in rather than calling out. Could you explain this idea of calling in you try to promote? Uh, you want to go Natalie or you want me? Uh, I, was, I was asking you, Loretta. Oh, okay. But I, I will be very, very glad to hear Natalie on this afterwards. Well, I was happy to see that young people had created the concept of calling in as early as the Occupy movement in 2011. And in 2015, this young uh, Vietnamese American writer had talked about calling in. And that was about the same time I heard the term. So I don't know if I'm quote, I can't be credited with pointing it. But for me, calling in is a call out done with love. That's the simplest explanation. And that means you're not ignoring the harm, but you're also not overstating it, exaggerating it, or overreacting to it. Because if someone misgenders somebody, you can just respond with love and say, you know, I prefer wow, wow, wow you know, this or that, instead of, you're misgendering me and you just re-raped me all over again because nobody will accept my identity. I mean, you can have, those are choices you get to make. And the, and the best example I have is from a student in my class who I accidentally misgendered. And he told me quite calmly, because I was expecting to be like blasted out because, you know, you work so hard on getting this right. And he said, Oh, that's all right, Professor Ross. I misgender myself sometimes. We're all learning. And I thought that was the most explicit grace. Now, of course, I need to work on doing it better. That's not an excuse for me to continue to do it because it's a skill that we're all trying to learn. But it was also from an 18-year-old showing us how to be in good and honest relationship with each other without the assumption that we mean to cause harm to each other simply because we make mistakes. Yeah, I agree that like, there's such a communication problem that some people have where, I don't know, it seems like what they want to do is to express that they're hurt, right? But, and like, okay, I understand that like, you know, sometimes people say hurtful things and like you're entitled to express that, but it's also worth like thinking about like, what's the effect of your expression, right? Like who's going to hear what you're saying and how are they gonna respond? And people who are feeling attacked will defend themselves, right? So I think that, um, you know, even without it, just like, even without like saying like an ethical discussion of, oh, it makes you a better person if you respond with love. Like it also makes you more likely to be listened to mm -hmm. if you respond with love, right? Like, because that, that way people don't shut down and the way that people shut down, if they feel you're saying, oh, you're a terrible person. Like if you're hearing, oh, I'm someone that's calling me a terrible person, your ego defends itself, right? It says, no, you're crazy, right? This, these crazy social justice warriors are attacking me and political correctness has gone too far and that's what's going on here, right? And I'm fine. Uh, so I don't know, people, I've, I've, I've met very few people in my life who are capable of being attacked in that way and responding calmly. Most people, it's just the fact of the matter, it's, like, it's just human psychology. Most people, when attacked, will defend. So you have to find a way to call people I hope people say use the word calling in, call people in, in a way that doesn't make them feel like you are attacking them. Um, I mean, you know, and some people it's true, they won't listen. And, you know, those people, there's not much you can do with them. But I think a lot of people will listen if you're able to kind of reach out in a more human way that's not like just attempting to sort of vilify them or attempting to shame them even. Mm -hmm. It's but also very... very no, it's also about like DMing instead of publicly shaming, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to say yeah. there is a legitimate critique, though, to the calling in process. And that is, it presumes that you're willing to do the emotional labor of investing in someone else's growth. So it should always be voluntary, it should never be obligatory because. 
that means you're taking time out of your very busy day to help somebody else grow. And so you're very free to walk away and say, I ain't got time for this. Grow up, get up, you know, whatever. So I don't want to act like it's a it's a routine that everybody must take on. Nah, it's a choice too. Sometimes you're in a sufficiently healed space where you're willing to help someone else grow. Not maybe so they won't harm you, but so they won't harm somebody else the same way in the future. But sometimes you just want to say, talk to the hand. <laughs> I, I ain't ready to have that conversation with you. And I love the way Sonia Renee Taylor has an approach on it. She said, I don't believe necessarily in calling in. I believe in calling on people to be better human beings. And that way I don't have to invest in their emotional growth or maturity, but I can certainly tell them what my expectations of them are. Yeah, I agree that it is work and like, no, it shouldn't be the the thing that you're obligated to do under any situation, because like I said, it is like, it's much easier to express how you feel and not like to, to go about to thinking like, oh, how am I going to work on this person? It's, you have to choose carefully when you do that because most of, because nine times out of 10, that is a waste of your, of your time. And I think that, I mean, the way I sort of have chosen to manage it in my own life is I make these videos where I can sort of, I mean, I, I'm not reacting in any way, right? I've taken weeks usually to think about exactly what I want to say and how I want to say it. And I think that, you know, I am also getting paid to do this, which I should be getting paid to do it because it's work, right? Like, I think that, you know, to be honest on Twitter, I'm probably not going to spend a whole lot of time like responding to some individual person and trying to educate them because I have better things to do with my life. Um, but yeah, there's moments, I think, when it can really be worth it to try. Like, I don't know, I think that, I guess I don't know if I can come up with an example off the top of my head, but sometimes, I don't know, a public figure on Twitter, let's say like a public figure on Twitter posts something mildly transphobic because they don't understand what they're talking about. Like, that, I don't, I don't know. I think in that situation, my inclination is not to immediately jump down their throat because they're going to double down and do the whole thing. It's either not to respond at all, or if you're up to it, you know, respond in a way that's that's sort of to the average person is going to look more inviting i guess than just the like but twitter twitter also doesn't encourage that right because that's part of the problem too is it actually drives like attention and it drives like it's a platform that rewards like the snarky clap back yes. right yes. like you quote tweet you say you say the thing that makes them look bad and then you're done and you get the retweets and like it's very tempting to just do that but uh, I don't know. I don't really see that as as very helpful. It just kind of draws attention to yourself, really. Mm -hmm. And there's a monetization about the social media, too. Every time a negative comment or a conflict reaches 1 million users, the platform that has that comment on it made $400,000. So it's like we're the unpaid interns for the internet when we use it for the call out cost because we're not getting any part of that $400,000. Remember, we're paying them to let us make them money. I mean, it's just it's a very absurd relationship. And we can't get in, can, any control over the ownership of our labor if we continue to give it away for free <laughs> to the mm -hmm. Twitterverse. Mm -hmm. So what happens when someone does that, when someone's make like a very witty joke to get some retweets and is actually shaming and making someone else feel very bad? Is it that this person forgot there is a human behind the account? Does it internet that enables us to disconnect from the fact that we're actually talking to people with, with feelings? I do think people, for, I mean, I think it's easy not to think about it when you're online. like you i i used to do this like when i was uh you know a little earlier in my internet career i guess like back in i don't know i remember 2017 like i used to to go on twitter and i would like retweet someone's bad take and 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 blast them basically for for saying something wrong um i guess i would i would learn to kind of feel bad about it though because it never helped and it often kind of just 
it, it just poured fuel on a fire. It ignited all this conflict and all this anger, and all this negativity on both sides. And then I felt like, I don't know, I accomplished nothing except making a bunch of people angry. And I sort of learned to stop doing it because I just didn't feel good about it. Like I didn't feel good about doing that. So, um, you know, I, now I, I just kind of try to keep an eye on, I sort of develop, I guess, a sense of judgment about who is someone who is like worth maybe reaching out to and, and talking to, and who is someone who has just, you know, been called in, been corrected, been reached out to a hundred times for the last four years and is simply never going to change. Because there's people like that too, like they're not worth your time. And in that case, I just kind of block them because I I don't know, I have, I have better things to do with my life than get angry at people who are never going to change. A part of it also is accepting that we have to deal with people as they are, not as, as we wish they were. And so you can spend a lot of time in life wasting your time trying to make people be who you think they should be instead of accepting and dealing with them in the reality of who they are. And that doesn't mean that you don't have expectations of them, but at the same time, you don't have false expectations of them, that you actually see them. Usually they have, they have that inner good person that they think they are that doesn't necessarily match up with that outer bad behavior that they're doing. And the more than you can use a calling in strategy by emphasizing that inner good person instead of focusing on the outer bad person, the more likely you are to not only help them grow, but be around to witness it. But if you start by emphasizing the outer bad person, like Natalie said, they're just gonna double down and walk away from you because they felt that you first you didn't see them, you didn't see their good side, and you didn't respect them. That combination means that they shut their listening down to you anyway. Mm -hmm. There is a one danger when you when you try and, and tell people uh, be calm, be polite, act with love and kindness. Uh, there is uh, tone policing. It's often something we we ask women, people of color, or left wing activists, like be more polite, ask nicely, and it's not a good thing, right? Because our anger and 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 the fact that we have emotions and express them, it's also what makes activism alive. So how do we? Uh, I don't know, what, what, how do we answer to, to, to this danger of tone policing that might kill us in politics? Tone policing is what others tell you to do. Staying calm is what you tell yourself. There's mm -hmm. a difference. As there's a real use for righteous anger and outrage. I'm not saying that. Again, why should you let someone else's uh, impressions of you when they don't even know you dictate your behavior, but your most important relationship is with your own integrity. How do you constantly maintain a good opinion of yourself requires work. And that requires making choices that make you feel good, not making choices that makes not only you feel yourself feel worse, but makes the world worse than it really needs to be. Yeah, I think this, all this advice that we're talking about calling in, not calling out, you know, re, you know, being, you know, reaching out to someone's good side, like all of this can kind of be misused by someone who wants to like lecture you about how you're behaving on, like, I don't know, sometimes you are righteously angry, or sometimes you are, um, you know, you're, you're on Twitter calling out someone who's like very, very deeply deserves it. And like being like, um, mate, have you considered like maybe you should not be angry I and mean, then just calm down? Like, like that can be, uh, I think that's kind of a misuse of the, of the complaint about cancel culture, right? But I think that, yeah, it's not everyone, you don't, not everyone's always gonna be thinking like strategically, but like in the moments that you have where you do think like, why am I doing this? I think it's also like good for people to ask, like, why are, especially on the internet, like, why am I spending time on this? Why am I spending time on this on this app complaining about celebrities? Like, what am I hoping to accomplish here? Uh, I think it's good to ask yourself that question because I think that a lot of people get into this for like reasons that are like not super healthy. 
Um, I think it can be kind of like a vent for a lot of rage that's not expressed elsewhere. And I think that Twitter, like it, it doesn't, um, it's not a good vent because it really just encourages more of this. It just sort of magnifies anger, resentment, conflict. Um, and I don't know, I often find that if I spend too long on an, on, on, on online doing that kind of thing, like I just start feeling bad about myself. I start feeling bad about the world. I start, because I'm not doing anything helpful. I'm just sort of getting sucked into this like cycle of, of, of frustration and hatred. Mm -hmm. And I don't even do it often, but the few times I've blown somebody up on the internet, I've regretted it. Yes, Tim. You know, and it's not something that I do often. But one time I was working with a colleague who took credit for some work that I'd done. And the colleague not only took credit for it, but did it very publicly in talking to our funders and our and our and our friends and stuff. And so without thinking about it, I put this person on full blown blast because why would you steal my work? Why would you tell all the people that we have to work with that you did something that you didn't actually do? And actually there's so many people that know you didn't do it. So why would you even expose yourself as a liar? Was what I was saying. It turned out my tone was so heavy handed that the, the way the public read my response to the theft was that I was the bully. That I was using my power, my privilege, to bully, oh, this very little tiny person who burst out into tears when she read my 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 tweet. And of course, she found a whole community to hold her with her tears. And it didn't even help that it was another woman of color. I can't even say it was a white woman. It was another woman of color. You know, it was. And so I've just learned that I don't ever want to put anything on the internet that I want to walk back. I want to be able to look at everything I say on the internet straight in the eye without shame. Mm -hmm. I think I had an experience early on on YouTube of kind of, so this is, this is a little bit different, but I think early on it sort of didn't necessarily occur to me that if I talked about someone, they would see what I said. I think this is like, I think this is an experience that um, I think most public figures understand that obviously anything they, they, they post will be seen. But I think to like, some of what we're talking about is like mob canceling, right? We're talking about like mass shaming. I think a lot of the individual people participating that may genuinely sort of like not really think through that the person they're talking about will see it. Like I can remember, um, I don't know, in 2016 or something like saying like kind of mean things about someone in a video. And then when they left a comment on the video being like immediately feeling this like sense of shame for what I'd done, I was like, oh God, like, I didn't say that thinking that they would see it. I think a lot of people would tweet, like they can't imagine that someone who has, you know, a hundred thousand followers or whatever would, would ever see their little tweet. But they, but the truth is that I think people do. I think people are, are, are kind of narcissistic and people read about themselves. So if you talk about someone, they're going to see it. And like, I don't know, sometimes it can help to, uh, well, you know, in YouTube, for example, I know that if I say something about another YouTuber, like there's consequences to that because I'll probably run into them at, I don't know, at VidCon or the conference or whatever. Like, so that kind of limits me in terms of like, I won't say anything to someone that I won't say to their face. Um, that doesn't mean that I won't criticize them because some of these people, I will say to their face what I think. But I think that, um, yeah, the internet does make it easier. It makes it easier to trash talk people. I've, I've had the experience of, talking to someone who previously had just been just horrible to me on online. And then somehow I find myself in a group, like a video call or something with them. And suddenly, and, and they're completely like respectful and like, oh, very, very quiet and very like, oh, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's, I don't know, it's easier to, it's easier to rage in the tweets than it is in the streets. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I think it's also interesting to remind that for some, for, for many people, internet is also the only way, the only platform. I mean, maybe there is also this rage of calling out and like shouting that you're angry, then you're hurt. It's because there is nowhere else some people 
uh, especially uh, women rights activists, anti-racist activists can actually talk out. They don't own medias, they don't own publishing houses, they don't own TV channels. So, so it's I think that the difficulty is here. That how how can we try and measure a, a place that is the only place where the expression can uh, can reach out to the world? Yeah, I do try to keep that in mind. That like some of these people on Twitter, like they want, they just want to be heard, right? Like they want, they don't have an opportunity to be heard most of the time. And they don't have what I have, which is this big like YouTube platform where I get to make my my opinion heard. I get to tell, tell my side of the story. Some people don't have that. And I do try to keep that in mind before I get too mad with someone who's raging at me on Twitter. It's like, well, this person doesn't have an opportunity to express what they've been through and this is it for them. So like, I don't know, that's, that is something I do try, I do try to keep in mind, yeah. Mm -hmm. But we also need to recognize that we're at a sad place in humanity where people are trying to cre create these online communities for themselves, for sustenance, for support, for affirmation, and largely because they lack that in some way in their real lives outside of the internet. But the attention of the internet is fleeting. They're like a constant, you know, millions of one night dates one when I stand, it's like, that is not real community, but people's need for community can be expressed that way. And so I find that a lot of people who abuse the call out culture are really looking for affirmation that should be addressed in other ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had that experience. I mean, I think this is part of the, the struggle I have, I think with a lot of the trans community online is that, well, so like the, the family rejection rate for trans people is like around 50%. So you have a population of people who like disproportionately is dealing with this trauma of rejection. They don't have a strong community. They don't have a support network and they're hoping to get a sense of belonging online. And I did, I mean, early in my transition, like I did this myself, like I relied on trans people on the internet to make me feel like I had a place to express, you know, experiences that are very alien to most people. And I had this sense that I, these people were my friends or like a support network. And then a few months in, they turned against me because I, uh, I guess I agreed to do a debate with someone who they thought, well, so with someone who was like kind of transphobic. Um, and the, I guess they saw it as a betrayal, right? I was talking to someone who was bad. Like, right, I talked to one of the enemies, therefore I was untrustworthy. And they totally hurt, turned against me and it hurt me so bad. And I was depressed for two weeks and didn't get out of bed because I had come to rely on this internet community to give me emotional support while I learned not to do that again. <laughs> so, yeah. But it's very interesting you reaching this point, Natalie, because I wanted to ask you about the psychological impact of being cancelled. Uh, so that's what you talked about in this video. And, and you say it in a very uh, uh, emotional and pudic at the same time way. But it's giving you a huge depression, right? To be feel rejected by this community online you had built for yourself. Yeah, I think that when I'm, it's important. I mean, there's, there's sort of different um, levels of severity that, 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 you know, canceling can happen on. And sometimes when people complain about being canceled, they're just being giant babies who can't take criticism. But it's also important to keep in mind that sometimes this can be really, really nasty. Like for me, the worst part of it was basically everyone, everyone who I have is like a colleague or a collaborator or a friend was basically getting flooded with messages demanding that they publicly denounce me as an enemy, right? Like, and so that was the sense of just like paralyzing, like, I can't do anything. I can't show my face. Like, I can't anything I say in public will now be like further used to increase the basically harassment of not, not just me, but like of everyone I know. And that it, it was just like this incredibly isolating experience where, you know, you feel hated, you feel like, you know, the enemy of the people essentially. Right. And uh, you know, you, you feel like, you know, some people 
especially people you don't know as well, some people did kind of distance themselves from me. So you feel like increasing isolation as like the, the social network around you, like moves away from you and kind of turns against you. It's like an awful, awful feeling, especially when you're sort of short on other places to go, which I think people who are drawn to activism in the first place are disproportionately likely to be in that experience because right, it's, it's marginalized people who get involved in this kind of thing and marginalized people kind of by definition don't have other places to go a lot of the time. So when like the movement turns against you, you're really, really alone. Mm -hmm. um, very often you hear people calling out others by saying they should progress, they should get better. And I see it as a vision of social justice as being a straight path towards the higher level of activism, which would be like, you know, activist perfection, activist purity. Isn't the problem exactly there? Like aiming towards perfection is like, there is a mistake in this image. Loretta. Yeah, yeah but that assumes that political purity is both achievable and desirable. <clears throat> and it's neither. Uh, we do not necessarily want to have the absolute of we've got the right way or the wrong way and either my way or the highway. I mean, all human conversation is a forest of ambiguity. And you can actually have many different truths existing in the same space. Yes. That's what makes us human beings. And my truth doesn't have to be your truth. No matter then your glass lens and your eyeglasses has to be my glass lens and my eyeglasses. I mean, and so when you pursue political purity, you're working on the assumption that there's only one truth and the one is the one you're most fond of, and all of those other truths are bad, or that even trying to work on that one truth is a good thing. Like I said, that's when a lot of different people think a lot of different things and they move in the same direction, that's a movement. But when they think, when a lot of different people think one thing and they move in the same direction, that's a cult. And so I compare that political purity, madness that we substitute for real organizing work as cult-like behaviors that are inappropriate we're building a human rights movement. We're a movement of a lot of different people who entered it through different doors and in different ways with different priorities and different contexts and languages that we use to describe why we're in the movement. And your, the door I entered is not gonna be your door. The language I use is not gonna be your language. Even if we use the same word, we're gonna attach different meanings to them. Mm -hmm. So it's such an absurd way to do organizing, to assume that you have to pursue political purity and perfection from very imperfect human beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wish it were easier to express that, like, it's just a reality that you're just not going to like everyone who's on your side, right? Like there's all, there's a lot of different reasons why you might not get along or you might just sort of not be compatible with some people or a certain group of people. Um, sometimes it's like you just come from such different backgrounds or just different perspectives that it's like, it's like a little bit hard to communicate or sometimes, sometimes it's just like a clash of personalities. Like people have different personalities. People have different ways of expressing themselves and I, I have so often see this going on in like leftist spaces that these like interpersonal drama essentially is kind of masquerading as political opposition. And it's yes. like, I, if we could just like be honest about like, look, we can all be in a movement together and also constant and also like not like each other <laughs> and also not get along. And also yes. someone, you know, slept with your boyfriend. Like that's not a political struggle. That's, that's, you know, a real problem, but it's like, uh, that's, it's, you know, it's, yeah. it's, 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 there's, there's going to be conflict within a side. And I wish that we could express that. And, and instead of trying to pretend that every conflict is a political opposition. Yeah. 
Yeah, I sometimes want to say, you don't like my face, you don't like my voice, just say it. Don't yeah. use politics. Right. Too. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But also, I think people mistake the purpose of a movement, of a political space. The purpose of a political space, in my opinion, is to end oppression, not to solve your personal problems. <laughs> you know, and so there's so many other ways to work on your stuff. But we're together from all of our diversities because we've defined ending a specific oppression is the problem. And so it's not meant to be a womb. It's not meant to be a safe space. It's not supposed to be a space that only reflects your opinions. That's not its purpose at all. But people are attracted to human rights work because their human rights are violated. And they mistakenly think that our work is about their specific violation instead of ending all violations. Mm -hmm. I have one, one last question before I, I take a couple of questions from the public. Um, do you ever get tired? Of course. Uh, <laughs> every human gets tired. I mean, I think part of having endurance in this kind of work is knowing when to take a break. I mean, I know that there's this kind of like self-care discourse that's become like a bit of a parody of itself, mm -hmm. you know, bath salts or whatever. But like, I do think that like there needs to be like a uh, a self-care discourse of taking care of your body, taking care of your mind, not just because the so there's just so, like there's such a level of like personal unhealthiness in getting dragged, dragged into eight hours of Twitter drama or whatever. Like this is not, it's, it's not only is it a misuse of your time, it's also like bad for you. And I think that part of, you know, I have to make, I have to, I've done a terrible job of this last month, but I actually have to very like deliberately limit how much time I spend say on Twitter or say reading, you know, stuff that is going to be very upsetting to me or you know like like a lot of my videos are deal with like i don't know community communities that are sort of built built around bigotry online i cannot spend too much time in those for research purposes because it starts sinking into me and like mm -hmm. I, i feel myself internalizing that those judgments and so on so yeah you it's um i do get tired and i'm not always the, be the best at, at knowing when to quit <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, I've done anti-fascist work specifically since 1990, but I've also done work against, you know, misogyny and racism mm -hmm. for even longer, you know, starting in 1970. And so I find that the best way to dress, and I'm not talking about physical tired, because yes, I get physically tired. I had two hours sleep before I got up this morning and started a five Zoom day. So yes, there's that kind of tired, but the, the tired that I'm most afraid of is my, if my soul gets tired, if I start becoming cynical and not believing that the struggle is going to win. And if I get so impatient with the people who have their flaws, like I have my flaws, who I have to work with that I just want to walk away. And what works for me in terms of soul exhaustion is balance. And so there are times I just toggle my consciousness off and I'll watch something totally ludicrous, like the Twilight film, for example, <laughs> without doing an analysis of its gender <laughs> dynamics or its racial <laughs> dynamics. You have to have a toggle to turn your consciousness on and off or you will burn out. Your soul will get exhausted by being demanded to be on all the time without any relief. And that balance is achieved by having totally apolitical or non-political friends. I remember being in Plaza Mayor in Spain when, when George Bush invaded Iraq on February 15th of that year. And I mean, it was a wonderful thing to, to, to be there and, and to watch that. But we're a country that's a perpetual war. So we're always making war on other people to take, to take their resources. And the same time I'm opposing the war on Plaza Mayor, I've got a whole bunch of friends who are dear to me 
who are doing yellow ribbon parties for the soldiers, <laughs> you know? And we don't necessarily talk about politics, but we do talk about our love for each other and how we're there and important in our lives in very significant ways. And I just want to pick up on something that Natalie said about estrangement from families, because I haven't talked about this in, on this show, but my estrangement from my family is because I'm trying to hold them accountable for multiple generations of childhood sexual abuse. And so I've got a portion of my family that, that speaks to me, and I've got another portion that wishes I never existed because I'm embarrassing them, bringing shame to the family. And then I write about it publicly and all these things. And so there's a lot of reasons people don't have the families they wish they had, but we have to deal with the families that we have. And that's one of the reasons I'm intentional about creating family that I know will be there at my funeral, even if we never talk politics. Yeah, Thanks. I found um, I found at moments I don't know when some some horrible thing is going down on Twitter. For example, one of the most helpful things to me is honestly to go out for a drink with a friend who has no idea what any of this is and doesn't have a Twitter account, and then I try to explain what's happening. And <laughs> something so about long. that process of explaining, I realize how just convoluted, inconsequential madness the whole thing is, and it kind of makes me like. I just feel the tension sort of beginning to dissolve as I, as I see their their bored face looking back at me as I explain this totally trivial conflict. Mm. Um, so we only have uh, uh, five minutes left, uh, but uh, uh, many questions actually, and it's always a weird question to ask to someone who is in the present, but the public always asks that. So how do you see the future of activism? Will there be a post Twitter, post Reddit, post Instagram, uh, Instagram uh, feminist struggle? Uh, everybody, like, yeah, there are three questions about this future. How can we imagine the following? Are you inspired? <laughs> Natalie, well, maybe you're you're inspired. I, uh, yes, I mean there's a, there's going to be a future, and the internet's going to change. I I don't unfortunately I don't have a crystal ball. Like I don't know what the next because it's a lot of this is going to respond to like changes of technology, and I don't know what those are. But um, yeah, I don't know. I think that one thing I do see sort of happening now is people are becoming more aware of the way that the, that our current technology, our current social media, mm. we're becoming more aware of how it works. And that awareness and that self-consciousness about it, I think can be helpful when, uh, you know, you can, you can sort of identify a pattern. Like you can say, oh, it's this thing happening again. And we sort of know how that goes. And then it's not quite as like, you know, if you, I don't know if, if, so you're being canceled on Twitter. Okay. Well, we, so I feel like now I sort of know what that is, what that's like, what that means. And so it's not as like raw and upsetting as it was maybe the first time it happened because I sort of understand that it's not the end of the world. Like it feels like it is, but it's not. And, uh, you know, I sort of know how to handle that badly and how to handle it well. And I think that as more and more people sort of, you know, come to like a deeper understanding of how this works. I think that uh, I think that, that things will sort of change for the better, at least I hope so. Mm -hmm. Loretta, what does your crystal ball say? <laughs> well, the, my crystal ball says, it's really a Sankofa moment. That's an old African saying that you look to the past to bring from the past what you need in the present. And for me, all human, destiny is tied to the relationships that we have and as technology has changed from the, the telegraph machine to the telephone to the television to to the internet i mean it's all still about the predictability of human relations and how predictable we are as humans we just have better and faster toys to play with and yes the toys do change us too but not as much as we like to think, because we've got those same old emotions, the same old flaws. Those it's just we have the speed now to spread our flaws more widely, maybe. Um, and so the future is going to hold the same old messed up humans the present has, and we're just going to have bigger and better and more expensive and maybe smaller toys to play with. 
because I mean, the first computers were this big and now they're this big. So I'm not that worried about the future because I take a lot of comfort in the fact that when I look at the past, it was the same old human beings. And so when I look at the future, it's going to be the same old human being. Now, what I hope changes is that we understand and have really understand what COVID has done to us. Yes. And that yes. is lifting up the whole concept of human interdependence. We need each other. One person's behavior simply does affect us. It's not that individual liberty. I don't need a mask because I don't have to care about someone else. I hope we put that whole individual, alienated individualism to rest. Because right thinking people understand that we are actually dependent on each other and interdependent. And whether I know you or not, whether you're healthy is going to affect whether I'm healthy. Whether you're starving is going to affect whether I have food. I mean, this is an ancient African concept of Ubuntu, but in its present form, it's being expressed through COVID, particularly the terrible effect it's having on the United States, where, of course, we've got the worst outbreaks, the most deaths, the most stupidest president. I mean, we've got a lot of things congealing, <laughs> congregating to create a perfect storm, worse than any other country in the world. But if there is a silver lining, it's because people are saying, yeah, it's not just about me. It's not just about my family. It's not just about my identity. It's about I have to be aware and concerned about all these other people because my money or no, no gun or no wall can actually keep a virus out. Mm. Thank you so much for this conclusion, Loretta. Uh, thank you to both of you. Thank you, Natalie. It was such a, a pleasure to be talking to you. That's a good thing about using Zoom. It's a good silver lining too. I've been able to interview you both, even if you're very far away. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me on. This was uh, lovely speaking to both of you. All right. And I really enjoyed this. Good luck. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you to, every, to everybody who followed the conversation. Bye.